Let's pray. Oh Lord God, we pray that your word would dwell richly in us. Because your word truly is that which came from you, your son, who not only lives in us, but allows us to put your word into practice. May your spirit move on our hearts and minds today, we pray. Amen. So who do you identify with in a story? Is it the central hero or someone else? A lot of this actually depends on how the author of the book or the director of the movie frames the narrative. Many stories have a character who is designed to be the one we identify with. It's called an audience surrogate. And a, a classic case of this is Dr. John Watson uh, in Sherlock Holmes. Every Sherlock Holmes story is narrated by Watson as he recalls his adventures with the great detective. This means we have no choice but to enter the story through Watson's perspective and are supposed to identify with him. Holmes is always at something of a distance in the narrative, and this is a deliberate move, uh, because Conan Doyle really wants us to be in awe, in some ways, of the great detective, uh, who is presented often in almost superhuman terms. We're not really meant to identify with him. But in most modern movies with a hero, I'd say these days, the audience is meant very much to identify with that hero. Whether they're a superhero in a cape, or have some other set of powers, or just happen to be someone impressive and whose story is worth following. While there are, are some exceptions with audience surrogates, this move I, I, I generally noticed isn't as popular uh, anymore. People generally want to identify with the hero and join them in their journey. In fact, even if the character is an anti-hero, morally ambiguous. But no matter who the central character is, with one of these movies, you can easily leave the theater feeling like you have accomplished something. You've walked in the hero's shoes and done what they have done for the past two hours, neither saved the world, rescued some people, brought the villain to justice, or just done something really impressive. Done right, this kind of story can make you feel great. The trouble, of course, is that it's not real. When you leave the dark of the theater, you're not the hero on the screen. You haven't done what they have done. This kind of story can absolutely inspire us to go out and do something heroic, helpful, significant, or beautiful. But the story can't do it for us. In the end, it's up to us and whatever skills, abilities, and determination we have at our disposal. Yet there is one story that is different. Indeed, to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, there is one true story that all these other fictional stories ultimately point to, even if their creators did not know it. And that is the story of Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection. This is a story where we are intended, meant to fully identify with the main character, no matter how different we may feel from him in our lives. Everything that happens to Christ, everything that he does, we also do. We live with him. We die with him and are resurrected with him. And in this one case, we're told the identification is real, completely and absolutely authentic and genuine. And if we'll let it, an identification that can and should have real world consequences. This is what the Apostle Paul reminds the Colossians in this letter. And it continues to be a reminder for anyone who is drawn to the story of Jesus today. He says, since you died with Christ, the elemental spirits of the world. Why? As though you still belong to the world when you submit to its rules. And a little later he says at the beginning of our reading today, since 
then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Dying and rising with Christ is one of Paul's central teachings across all his letters. And one of the primary ways he talks about both salvation and living our lives as Christians. Because God became fully human in Jesus. Because the Son of God became a material part of this created world. And because heaven came down to earth, earth can be reunited with heaven. Creation can be redeemed and restored. And human beings can be reconciled to God and indeed live into that divine image we were always meant to fulfill. And all we have to do is accept the free gift of what God has done in Jesus. Identify with Jesus. Be united with Jesus. Give Christ our trust, our loyalty, and our love. And when we choose to be one with Jesus, the amazing thing that Paul is suggesting repeatedly is that everything that's true about Christ on one very real level becomes true about us. Everything he's done, we have somehow also done. Sin and death are defeated and we have eternal life with God now and in the age to come. Paul says this quite beautifully a little further on in this chapter. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Christ has done the work, and yet we are welcomed, embraced by him to go where he has gone and where he is now. This is a deep spiritual reality and one that is signified and symbolized in Christian baptism. Especially when it's done by full immersion. You can see the symbolism more clearly. But even if there's just a sprinkle, as is typically the case in a Presbyterian church, the symbolism is still there. We go down under the water into death and up through them into resurrection life with Jesus, dying and rising with Christ. And Paul claims that all of this is real. But the symbols point to a deeper reality, and this is something I believe as well. The challenge is that though it is real, it's not yet realized in this life. We don't instantly become like Jesus the moment we believe and get baptized. It would be wonderful if we did. But that only comes at the end of the story, when all creation is made new and we are made new with it. But the claim is that that future reality still affects us in the present. The future actually shapes the present. And it's true here and now, even if we have a very long way to go. In Jesus, God sees and accepts us as we will be. Even though to the outside, very little may seem to have changed. Indeed, in Jesus, God accepts us as we are, even as he is inviting and calling us to become who we were meant to be. And this is the paradox of Christian life, of Christian living. It is both free and incredibly costly. It is completely effortless and unbelievably demanding. It accepts the worst sinners and aims for the highest moral and ethical standards imaginable. Keeping this paradox between God accepting us as we are and also calling us into transformation, total top to bottom transformation is incredibly important. It's also very easy to slide one way or the other. And to go back to that passage, Last week in chapter 2 of the letter, we heard Paul give a reminder that we must not give in to teaching or perspectives that tell us that we need to earn our way to God somehow. Through rules or rigorous spiritual and physical practices, things that we do 
to get our way there. This path can lead to self-righteousness and arrogance, or it can drive away us or others who know that there is no way they can live by these kinds of rules and expectations. Or there are those who try and ultimately fail and end up further away from God than when they began. This path also denies that Jesus has done enough to save and reconcile us to God, as we talked about last week. So we still somehow have to earn our, the rest of the way. To this, Paul says, Jesus is more than enough. We just have to accept what he has done and give him our trust and loyalty, and he will carry us the full way. Yet when we have accepted Jesus and recognize that God accepts us as we are, we must also avoid the opposite path of thinking we can now stay just the way we are or do whatever we want now that we are saved and forgiven and united with God. God's done all the work. I can sit back and relax. We must look up to Jesus and seek his help to grow up into his divine image. Or to put it another way, we're not only called to accept what Jesus has done for us, but respond in gratitude. And this is where Paul lands at the end of the passage. But the peace of Christ rule in your hearts as members of one body, you are called to peace. And be thankful. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. God has done an amazing thing for us. Therefore, we respond in gratitude, in practical ways. Now, this might seem like a small thing, but our attitude and reason for pursuing what is good, what is right, just, wise, and beautiful, matters as much as what we are trying to do. There is a world of difference between trying to do good in order to earn our way in life and trying to do good out of gratitude and thankfulness. The first, when you drill down, is ultimately self-centered. We can accomplish, it is about what we can accomplish by ourselves and for ourselves. And it will ultimately change what we are trying to do, that self-focus in it. The second, the way of thankfulness is other-centered. Focus on what we can do for God, for Jesus, and for others. And this can keep us on the right path even when we struggle to make positive steps. There is no much greater joy and peace in thankfulness than in trying to claw our way to some goal. Thankfulness gives us the freedom and joy that will just spill over into how we think of God, how we think of others, and also how we think of ourselves. So how does all this work in practice? Well, we go back to the image of dying and rising with Jesus. There are things in the old life that must die or be taken off, shed like old clothes. There are things in the new life that must grow and be put on like new clothing. This is likely another baptism metaphor. The early church candidates for baptism took off their old clothes and were given new ones. Something we still, many of us, did with our own children when we brought them to baptize in those cute little white outfits. It's actually very old practice. So Paul says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And he goes through the list that we see on, on, on the screen here. The first part, there's five things the parent, that Paul is deliberate in his numbering of things. They mirror each other. The first deals with our desire, the things we want, the appetites we give license to, the things we give ourselves to. It is so easy for our desires to get distorted, whether that's sexual desire, whether it's desire for power, whether it's greed. And we know, particularly in our context, the power of desire to lead us in the wrong direction because we're in a place in time where any desire that you have, you can probably get it. 
And that can lead you, lead us, lead you, lead me down some very dark paths. And so, put to death those desires that are not directed to the good that God wants for us, for others, for this world. And then it comes to our attitudes. Attitudes that are often expressed in words. Things like anger, rage, malice, slander, abusive or filthy language. Lies. What we say so much reveals what's in our hearts. This is something Jesus taught repeatedly. We can think of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus equates insulting language with murder at his heart. These are things where we invite Christ to come and take those parts of ourselves and lean this way, bring it down to death, so they can be replaced with other things. And Paul directs us to these. Therefore, as God's chosen people, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, and forgive as the Lord forgave you. Take off one set of clothes, put on another. And recognize that whose clothes these are. We talk about compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness. Who does that look like? It looks like Jesus. And it's him who allows us to put on these new clothes, who gives us the right to put on these new clothes. We grow in his image because out of his love he has taken hold of us. We die with him and we are raised with him into this new life. Now these are our work, this little, these dense ethical passages in Paul are, are actually very good to meditate on. To look at our lives and see where we are in those different lists. Where we are progressing in terms of putting the negative things to death. And where we are with growing and putting on the things that lead to life. Maybe this is a part of one that's I think, better done in Bible study than in, in a sermon. But I would encourage you, this, if you have a moment this week, just sit and think about these things. And seek the help of Christ and the Holy Spirit to lead you in reshaping our minds. This is ultimately about how we think, which leads into how we act. But again, this isn't something we just do by ourselves. It's a big part of why we are gathered here Sunday by Sunday. As Paul says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. Yes, it's important to study the word of Christ, but we do it together as you teach and admonish, challenge and encourage one another with all wisdom, not just through talk, but through praise, through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. What we do here Sunday by Sunday helps us to reshape our minds, our hearts, to take off the old clothes, to put on the new, week by week, encouraging each other, hearing the joy and the thankfulness in each other's voices, to give us that thankfulness we need to progress, and when we leave here, when we leave here, we are more equipped to live out these words. Whatever we do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. It allows us to represent the one who is our life. So it's a high calling. And yet it's one in which all the power to do it comes from the one who died and rose and takes us with him. So let us continue to grow into this life, to put on our new clothes and grow ever more into that image. Because it's an image the world needs. The world needs to see God, I think, more now 
than ever with everything that's going on in the world. And we can do that through Christ. We can represent Him. As we sing our songs, as we are changed and transformed in our minds, and as we demonstrate our thankfulness in what we do. May Father, Son, and Holy Spirit help us do these things in this week, in the weeks to come. Amen.